particular one lecture focusing on the neutron emitting technique. And we are pleased to invite Dr. Joseph Bavitt from the ACNS to talk about uh, this technique. So Dr. Joseph is a 3D imaging scientist and group manager for the imaging and string scanning group at ACNS Anstone. He utilizes neutrons, X-rays, and collaborates with national and global museums and universities to pioneer the use of neutron tomography to investigate the fossils and ancient heritage. Joseph currently holds a powerhouse, a powerhouse research fellowship. He was a, a lead scientist for the highly successful The Invisible Review exhibition at the MAAS Powerhouse Museum. This exhibition resolves the long-standing conservation and mysteries surrounding 26 objects from the MAAS collection. This work also revealed the power of X-ray and neutron beam uh, to reveal the cultural material secrets. Based on this, we can see Joseph is not only the scientist, but also the artist. And actually, his work aims to bridge the gap between the science and the art. So his work uh, has been worldwide recognized. For example, his work has achieved the Museum and Gallery National Award for Research uh, in 2022. So now let's warmly welcome Joseph to give us this talk. Thank you very much, Teng, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'd like to start by acknowledging country and uh, the traditional owners of the lands where we all gather today in our respective venues um, uh, and respect those past, present and emerging. I'm on uh, Darug land in Western Sydney and um, uh, Anstow sits on the Darug people's land. So acknowledge all of those and you're present. Thank you. Okay. For most of you, your first experience of radiography is most likely at your doctor's, uh, and that's where you're exposed to x-rays. Um, and in my case, studying neutrons, we're never going to uh, put people in our neutron beams for obvious reasons. So um, I thought I'd just start with a warning, and that is that if you are uh, sensitive of stomach, and uh, shy of dinosaurs or Egyptian mummies, you might want to step away later on the talk. So I'm just giving a warning. The basic principle of radiography, it, it's based on transmission. So you have a, an X-ray, neutron beam, radiation beam, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, and part of that uh, beam of particles or light is attenuated by a sample. And by attenuation, that can involve uh, coherent or incoherent scattering um, or absorption, uh, the end result with imaging is that you get a transmitted image onto a detector, which if you have a look at the picture of the coffee mocker on the right hand side, gives you an idea of what a, a neutron radiograph looks like. In this case, water stops neutrons and you see that uh, the bottom of the pot is dark, whereas the aluminium is relatively transparent to neutrons. So it's always good to clarify terminology. So I teach a similar class to kindergarten students, explaining to them what radiography, tomography, and so forth are. And uh, this is the simplest way of, of presenting the three types of imaging that we can deal with. So the first one is a photograph, which is a reflected. Uh, so a photograph is an image where you're obtaining the reflected radiation from a surface, and it gives you surface information, color, etc. A radiograph is a two-dimensional image due to the attenuation of radiation through a specimen, whereas a tomograph is a three-dimensional representation where you take those radiographs looking through the object, use some computation, and you use that computation to generate a reconstruction so we can look truly look inside the object. The reason why it's not just tomography but computed tomography is because there is some heavy computing power required to convert those radiographs into a three-dimensional data set. And that three-dimensional data set is taken by rotating an object um, as the radiation is passing through it, or conversely, 
keeping the object still and moving the radiation beam around that object. Either way, you're, you require typically at least 180 degrees or 360 degrees of radiographs relative to the object. And you need to do some computation to generate what are eventually some two-dimensional slices through your object. Now, I'm sure you've seen the interaction of X-rays and neutrons relative to the elements in prior lectures. So just to re-emphasize this, uh, the greater the number of electrons around an atom, the greater the scattering of an interaction with X-rays. Uh, and the same applies with uh, neutron and X-ray imaging. So the, the greater the number of electrons around an atom, the darker they will appear or the more they will attenuate X-rays. Whereas neutrons, you have more of a random order around the periodic table. So you get uh, elements such as hydrogen are fairly opaque to neutrons. And then other elements such as lead that are opaque to X-rays are in fact transparent to neutrons. The end result is that if you take an object such as this camera and you conduct radiography using either neutrons or X-rays, you just see different parts of the same object. So if we take these two pictures as an example, because neutrons are interacting with the nucleus as opposed to the electron cloud, um, you have the high sensitivity uh, to light elements uh, such as hydrogen and lithium. So if you look at the top picture, you'll see the, the battery is quite dark in the camera, whereas in the X-ray image at bottom, that battery is quite transparent. And you can look through the rest of it, might note that the film is quite visible with neutrons and not with X-rays. Back to Ansto. So it was uh, about 14 years ago that construction on Dingo actually began. Uh, so here are some photographs um, of the pouring of the concrete and installation of the uh, primary shutter and other components of Dingo. If you don't know where Dingo is, it's actually located adjacent to the uh, nuclear reactor itself in the reactor beam hall. So uh, it is actually the brightest uh, neutron beam in the southern hemisphere, and all that shielding there is to protect us from that uh, neutron source. The end result was that in August 2013, uh, Ulf Garb had completed construction of the instrument and captured the first images uh, uh, on Dingo. And uh, that photograph there shows what Dingo used to look like. It's a bit more complicated now, but um, I like his choice of first uh, sample, which is a mechanical alarm clock. And um, the anticipated CT scan times were roughly about one day for a typical neutron tomographic scan. And really the length that scans take depends on the size of the object and the resolution that you wanted to achieve. But what makes Dingo special? What makes Dingo special and one of the top five instruments of its kind in the world is uh, the ratio of the pinhole to the distance to the sample. The longer that path length relative to the pinhole size, uh, the more parallel the beam is. And so whereas you might be used, if you do radiography uh, in a lab-based situation, you typically have a cone beam geometry. Now the benefit of that is you get magnification um, of your object, uh, but the further you are away from the object, the lower your intensity, um, and you've got issues achieving uh, resolution under certain circumstances. So trying to do high resolution on large objects is difficult. With neutrons, because our beam is uh, quasi-parallel, it means you get no inherent magnification of the object, but it does also mean that you can do CT scanning with high resolution on large objects, because you're not limited by how close your sample needs to be to the, uh, to the source. Instead, you're limited by how close your object can be to the detector. So to give you an idea, we call this ratio L over D, or the, the path length from the pinhole to the sample, divided by the size of the pinhole. So Dingo's got a very small pinhole and uh, a long path length. And what you see in those images there, as, as that ratio gets larger, so does the sharpness of that image. And uh, Dingo operates at uh, an L over D of 500 or 1000, making it a quite high resolution instrument. I, mean, I mentioned uh, what makes the instrument special. So for us, it's our team. Uh, from left to right, that's me, Floriano, who's our Cultural Heritage Project Manager for ANSTO, Helen Cube, who's an Industrial Instrument Scientist with our team, 
and the infamous Ulfgaard, who designed, constructed, uh, built, and operated the instruments, uh, inducted me uh, as an instrument scientist when I came over in 2018, and has provided a massive amount of support to the team to get us where we are today. So we operate the instrument for around 300 days a year, the same number of days as the reactor operates. Around half that goes to the user program, and uh, the rest of it goes to, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, program programs of research, so longer research programs, commercial beam time, and other applications. The first paper, and this might bring back memories for you, Chris, um, is uh, really showcase the ability to integrate Dingo with other instruments at ANSTO. So the first publication involved uh, a collection of steel balls within a cylinder, and uh, all CT scanned these balls with Chris Wendrick um, to look at the distribution of these balls, and then carried this uh, collection of steel balls under pressure, um, under stress, to Kawari, which is our residual stress and strain instrument. And they were able to map the actual strength, uh, actual stress within the assembly of particles uh, using Kawari and able to visualize where those particles were using Dingo. And in that way, demonstrate the force chains that were occurring um, in this um, uh, granular material. If you look at the utilization of the instrument, you see that we do a lot of work with museums. About half of the beam time is um, applied research in, in the form of paleontology, cultural heritage. Uh, there's a lot of work done with the earth sciences uh, and engineering space as well, particularly with 3D printed metals, uh, but other material mixtures as well. So Dingo works really well where you've got composites. So where you've got polymers blended with metals, for example, you cannot image those polymers using x-rays, but they are visible with neutrons. Um, some unusual applications, complex fluids are there, and I'll highlight that case study uh, in a moment. So let's focus on industry. So Dingo finds great use in the application of uh, hydrogen fuel cells uh, or other fuel cells because water is opaque to neutrons, and therefore in any of these fuel cells where water is a byproduct, you can visualize where that water is. Similarly, in agriculture, if you're interested in looking at the flow of water through roots or through plants or through soil, that is uh, certainly possible uh, with neutrons. There's work done in planetary science, looking at meteorites, civil engineering, looking at porosity in steels, titanium and other materials. And in biology and medicine, uh, we're do actually, our team is actually working with other areas of ANSTO to develop uh, irradiation methods to uh, improve the development of future pharmaceuticals. Metals like titanium are not very transparent to X-rays. So if somebody comes to us with a 3D printed large titanium object like this crown here, there's not much you can do with it with X-rays if you want to image the porosity. Um, it's typically a slice and dice procedure where you do thin sections, you take photographs um, and you measure the porosity based on those thin sections. So Anya, for example, has been collaborating with RMIT University uh, to take large objects such as this uh, titanium crown and CT scanning on Dingo to look at things such as porosity and inclusions or contaminants, uh, in this case highlighted in red in the image on the bottom right hand corner, um, where the contaminants come from the wire cutting process. So neutrons typically have about twice the penetration of uh, relative to X-rays through titanium. I've been working, and other members of the team have been working with uh, Sydney water specimens that have come by Macquarie University or others. Again, the sensitivity of hydrogen is interesting because it means that we can take uh, drill cores from uh, sewers and look at the effect of acid attack on the concrete, look at the depletion of the concrete, and look at the increase in concentration of hydrogen or acid uh, with depth. So we've got a photograph of a sewer on the left. In the middle, there's a uh, cross-section through a tomogram or a neutron CT scan. Those yellow arrows are highlighting layers of enriched hydrogen or acid within the concrete. Um, and in the green layer is highlighting where a depletion of calcium has occurred. And we're able to visualize these changes uh, with neutrons uh, and therefore support uh, XRF and other measurements, but in the third dimension. 
our whole team tends to do work in uh, mining and looking at the challenges that Australia faces in terms of uh, ore purification and processing. Um, and we're moving more towards, instead of just conducting static uh, tomographs or, or 3D images, actually looking at experiments and conducting experiments in the beam. So an example that Floriana conducted um, a few years ago was to look at the softening and melting under load of uh, ferrous materials from mine sites. So uh, Floriana's background is metallurgy. Um, and in this case, a mixture of gases can be delivered uh, to a sample in Dingo, uh, where that ferrous burden is uh, uh, applied, has an applied pressure and is heated to high temperature. And using Dingo, we can actually radiograph that uh, material, look at the ferrous layer and the coke, look at the melting that occurs and the softening, and then CT scan that uh, every few hundred degrees. Uh, to get a visualization of the reaction front that's occurring in that material. Well, we all know I love paleontology and owe to the Americans if there are any. In 2015, I was actually running the user office. I then transitioned to Ansto's uh, research office and I was not an instrument scientist. Uh, my background is a PhD in chemistry, but um, it was actually at a presentation on um, accessing neutrons and the general applicability of our neutro neutron instruments to high school students that kicked off my career and what I do today. So I want to acknowledge those students down at the National New Science Forum um, and ANSI and AMBAG and all those that really got me into that area. But here I'm highlighting one student, Bengalia. And the reason why I respect him in my presentations is because I mentioned at this National Youth Science Forum that we had, so had just finished building a, a new instrument which could 3D image uh, steel blocks, engines, and so forth. Um, and one thing that I, I have always been interested in, like most people, are dinosaurs. And um, I thought, well, maybe there was an opportunity to follow my childhood dream and actually conduct some research in that space. This student jumped with excitement in the lecture theater, yelled out that he was actually a volunteer preparator or someone who carves fossils out of rocks at a museum. We got to talking immediately after that session, found out he worked at the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum in central Queensland. So I came back to Ansto from my trip to Canberra, asked for permission to start dabbling um, you know, one day a fortnight on the instrument. And within a week, we'd received a delivery from the managing director of the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum with a box of samples and a challenge. So within this box were a series of nodules. And I, I should say that uh, before these measurements were done, nobody was really exploring the potential for neutron imaging and paleontology because of the risk of uh, long-term radioactivity in specimens. So when neutrons uh, interact with materials, they, they uh, become neutron activated. And if you're borrowing samples from museums, the question is how long are they radioactive for? And so we started to do these measurements. Now, the very first result we got was this. This is a neutron CT result, just showing that this crab in a rock, which is completely invisible to X-rays, was immediately visible to neutrons. The residual um, radiation measurements showed that the specimen was active for about two weeks. The museum was happy with that. So we then returned the object. They physically prepared it based on the neutron scans, and that crab is now on display at that museum. Since that time, we've had successes from all over the world. Uh, we've now received fossils from Antarctica, from Greenland, uh, from every quadrant of the planet. And one of the most uh, diverse sites that we've been working with is actually a, a site in Oklahoma that we've been collaborating with uh, uh, Robert Rice at the University of Toronto. And it was through these samples that we learned the real benefit of neutrons um, to uh, paleontology. Now, if you look at these specimens, you'll note that these uh, are limestone blocks. Inside these blocks, you've got bones, and these bones are black. The reason why you tend to have black fossils is because they tend to be impregnated with hydrocarbons, either during the degradation of the soft tissue in the fossil itself from the organism, or 
from uh, petroleum infiltrating into the the um, the rock through the groundwater. And in this case, that's what happened. These critters lived in the US around 300 million years ago. They fell into limestone caves. Those caves uh, water deposits um, drowned the object, the um, samples, the animals, and over time, petroleum infiltrated those bones. Now, I also conduct work using the imaging and medical beamline, an MCT beamline at the Australian Synchrotron. And this provides us a nice opportunity to compare X-rays and neutron results for fossils. So if we take one of these skulls from Oklahoma and CT scan it using IMBO or X-rays, the radiograph on the left-hand side shows all these spots. And those spots are iron pyrite and fool's gold. What tends to happen is the interaction of iron in groundwater uh, reacts with sulfur from decomposing organic matter in those animals and plants. And you get precipitation of iron sulfide uh, within these fossils. Now, the benefit of neutrons is that iron uh, pyrite is transparent. The radiograph on the right-hand side, you do not see any of that fool's gold present. And that translates to being able to visualize the cross here are cross sections of the skulls and the bones, showing that uh, the pyrite mass obscures the images of the fossil and the X-rays. Whereas with neutrons, that pyrite mass is invisible. And because of the impregnating hydrocarbons within the bone, we get excellent contrast. Now, coupled with the high penetrating ability of neutrons through limestone, it means that we can actually take relatively large blocks of limestone, such as this 18 centimeter cube of limestone, give it a good CT scan. This took about three hours on the instrument. And that three hour scan has kept the PhD student busy for four years as they manually, as they digitally segment uh, this uh, block of um, it's a death assemblage. From that block, the students are digitally segmenting every single bone, looking in smeal, such as that encapsulated in the mouth of this trematophid, uh, but a whole heap of new species as well. Coming back to the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum, the other benefit of neutrons I mentioned is the transparency through iron-based materials. So let's focus on that. You see the picture of the dinosaur, a sauropod. These are the, uh, the giant plant eaters that roam the world. Now, the staff at the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum were using uh, front-end loaders, bulldozers, uh, to clear overburden to try to access uh, some of these um, large beasts. And in that process, shattered a large nodule. With, within this nodule, they noticed some bones and realized that they had the bones of a um, 93 million year old uh, or Cretaceous crocodilian. This thing that looks like chicken nuggets is actually the fossil. It's about a meter long. And the staff spent about two years gluing this specimen together. Now, the reason why it's been annotated with all these different colors is because this shattered mass, they weren't able to figure out where these rocks went together. They tried to CT scan it at a hospital and they really just could not see through the, the dense ironstone rock. And so it actually came to us as the first vertebrate fossil to ever be scanned with neutrons. And by sheer luck, the first sample that the museum gave us of this block was this little rock, um, number 11. We CT scanned this rock with neutrons and we found 42 tiny little bones within this palm-sized uh, piece of rock. We discovered that this rock contained some skin from the crocodile, it contained the shoulder, but more importantly, it contained this bone on the bottom right-hand picture that you can see. Looks like a chicken bone, and that little chicken bone's got a notch on the end, and that's diagnostic for a dinosaur bone. Now, I called the museum and told them straight up that uh, I was CT scanning and, and visualizing a dinosaur leg bone, uh, which they didn't believe at the time. Uh, but it took a few years to, of um, concurrent synchrotron and neutron imaging of the entire fossil to actually resolve what was going on. So this four centimeter leg bone was encapsulated within this iron mass. The end result was this remarkable combination of neutron and synchrotron X-ray CT scans where the entire one meter long crocodilian was CT scanned. The little blobs in red that you see were stomach contents, 
we were able to verify that by looking at the geology geochemistry of the rock and uh, joining together this 3D X-ray puzzle. And if you look at the 3D prints on the right-hand side, the bones on the left and the right are the crocodile's bones. The one in the middle is that dinosaur bone, which was found in the stomach contents. It's been partially bitten off and it has a bite mark uh, on one side. And this, this discovery was actually quite significant. Not only were we able to publish this crocodile and call it Confractosuchus soroctonus, which is basically the shattered uh, lizard killer, but this crocodile provided the first evidence that, di that dinosaurs were preyed upon and eaten by crocodiles, which is quite exciting. I also keep this picture up because it shows that we do a, a lot of work with artists and paleo artists to actually um, visualize and create reconstructions of the environments where these animals live. Sensitivity to hydrogen means that plants are CT scannable, fossil plants. So again, with x-rays, you don't see uh, much contrast. The um, carbonized material tends to be transparent. So we can visualize um, uh, pine cone seeds. We can look at the resin channels within those and then demonstrate how uh, they use fire for seed dispersal. In paleontology, we can look at fraud and authenticity of holotypes and other specimens. If you haven't heard of the word holotype, um, if you open a dictionary and look at a word and you find a definition, okay, physical objects also come with definitions. And so the first time you find, for example, a new species of, of moth or butterfly or dinosaur, and you define that object, uh, that becomes a holotype or a definition. So with the Archaeopteryx, the first specimen found is called the holotype. All others are then referred to that object. If the holotype is lost or if it's fraudulent in any way, that really messes up with the science. So here's an example of a, um, let's call it a bird. It's not, it's a feathered dinosaur relative, relative to, related to birds, older than T-Rex. It came to us uh, with a potential research project uh, to study what they thought were eggs in its belly. So all birds basically utilize a single oviduct whereas dinosaurs are believed to use um, two oviducts or uh, have two rows of eggs. And this bird was quite exciting because it looked like it had two rows of eggs within its belly. We've since learned that they were seeds, but that's irrelevant for what I'm about to show. So this fossil looks unaltered. When you place it in the neutron beam and look at the image on the bottom right-hand corner, you see all these white patches. Because of our sensitivity to hydrogen, we can visualize any adhesives or glues used in this fossil. And we're able to integrate the neutron data with uh, XRF and verify that indeed the head on this specimen had been glued on from something else. In other words, we were partway through writing a paper describing this new holotype when we discovered that in fact it was a, um, a chimera, a blended specimen. We can still research this object, it just means that we need to acknowledge that when we publish the paper on it. Not only do neutrons provide penetration through ion-based materials and contrast based on hydrogen, but we also yield contrast based on the presence of various rare earths that are often present in specimens. So here is a, a really cool sample. It's a skull of one of our ancestors, a stem mammal, it, either a reptile or a mammal, somewhere in between. We don't know if they had fur or not. In any case, this is a skull. When you scan it at the synchrotron, you get the image on the left. This is a cross-section through the skull. You don't get any a contrast except for the enamel on the teeth. With neutrons, you get this exceptional contrast within the entire skull. And you see some unusual features. I've highlighted those in yellow. So different rare earths, different uh, minerals are concentrated in different soft tissues. Uh, and we've actually found a case where it's not just a fossilized cast of a brain, but in fact, the brain itself has been fossilized. That's that white region on the left, surrounded by a dark layer, which is the meninges. There is a fossilized eyeball present and facial muscles and others. So neutrons are revealing soft tissue structures that we've never seen in fossils before. Before I wrap up with fossils, I just want to point out that um, ethics are a very large uh, uh, consideration when we are working in this space. And this applies not just to cultural objects, but also to fossils, uh, whereas fossils are considered cultural property. 
in countries have different rules about import export purchase and and loans and so all the work that we do uh, is in compliance with those and that's something we learned the hard way where a specimen did come to us from a country that um, did not approve the export of that uh, specimen and uh, we at ANSTO are very careful about what we do because we'd rather not have to go through the process of repatriating um, specimens um, if that occurs. One last fossil one, I promise you. The Goga Formation is in the Kimberley in Western Australia. It's important because uh, the community of fish and other specimens that are there lived uh, in the Devonian, so around 380 million years ago. And this period is significant because it's the time when fish were transitioning from the ocean, from sea to land. So they're de developing walking uh, appendages, uh, their eyes, brains, and other structures were mod being modified to accommodate this new means of locomotion and breathing and so forth. And what's really exciting is a group from Flinders University in Curtin um, are doing excavations or, or basically picking up nodules from this farm, splitting them open to see what's present and discovering a huge number of uh, species. One of those came to us prior to COVID and then eventually sat in my drawer through all of COVID uh, along with the data. And so it, let's say it had a five year break. So this sample had been scanned and then five years later, post COVID, we finally sat down and looked at this specimen in detail. Um, and it was a huge, uh, revelationary moment because when we opened up the data set, I didn't see anything special. I just pointed at this uh, bright white blob that appeared. But uh, the researchers identified that this fish had a fossil heart. Um, and indeed, um, Alice Clement at uh, Flinders Uni spent a lot of time segmenting that out um, and was able to distinguish the separate chambers of the heart and demonstrate that uh, the position of this heart relative to the um, the chest. This was recently published in Science um, last year, where it showed that early sharks or arthrodires that lived in this period had already evolved a heart that was very similar to ours, and that this heart sat basically right under the chin, and there are reasons for that. Um, so it's got a lot of attention, and it's the first science paper that's ever been achieved with neutron energy. I love the outreach. And we're doing a whole heap of um, unusual initiatives. So we worked with Australia Post um, and uh, the paleontologists that work with us um, liaise with paleo artists. And in 2022, a dinosaur discovered, uh, in, in this case, at Anstow using the synchrotron um, uh, at top right, was uh, printed as a postage stamp and placed on a $1 coin. And the reason why I've got the rest here is every single beastie that you see there has been investigating using neutrons and or the synchrotron at Anstow. Um, and we have papers on all but the Australovanita, which uh, is coming out shortly. So it's a really exciting part of what we do, the, the public engagement. Now, if you want to learn about what's out there at the moment, there's a really nice article in the current um, uh, current edition of Science News, which is available online, which talks about what we're doing in paleontology with neutron imaging. And if you live in Western Sydney, you might want to take a trip out to Stanhope Gardens Library in Blacktown City Council area. Where we've got a, a large 10 metre long window, uh, which highlights some uh, fossils and the work that we're doing at Anstow. Okay, cultural heritage. We have a defined culture heritage project at ANSTO that really aims to um, merge all the techniques that we have across all our platforms and apply these in a non-destructive manner for archaeometry, conservation science, and, and to use our material technologies to look at um, rare and delicate objects in a way that you just can't do using other methods. So Carla Raymond, who's just finished her PhD at Macquarie University, um, did a lot of work on Egyptian mummified remains. Floriana also conducts work with Sydney University in this space as well. And um, this mummified cat just shows the nice results that we're getting with neutrons. So with neutrons, we're able to couple that with X-ray data. We're able to visualize the wrappings of these cats, uh, these mummified animals. Uh, and that's they're not so easy to visualize with X-rays. And um, uh, Carla discovered in this case, using a combination of carbon dating, Synchrotron and neutron imaging, 
um, the first evidence of the recycling of mummified or sacrificed animals in ancient Egypt. So this is a case where a cat had been sacrificed, it had been uh, mummified and wrapped, sold to a, a pilgrim, placed in a temple, and then generations later, we're talking 500 years later, somebody had taken that cat out of the temple, unwrapped it, broken it into smaller pieces, and then it was rewrapped and, and sold as an offering, uh, which is uh, quite an interesting cultural insight discovered with neutrons. In terms of uh, conservation, if we look at the X-ray image of this ancient Greek flask on the left-hand side, all looks well, you see that these fragments have been placed together. Neutron imaging, on the other hand, reveals that uh, any repairs show up bright white. So you can see that part of this object has been replaced, which is understandable. But what's really impressive is we're able to visualize even the sticky tape that was used to hold the object together within the, um, within the flask. And that's just not something you can see with X-rays. Now lead. Lead cannot be penetrated with X-rays. So ancient lead objects are examples where x-rays cannot be applied at all. The reason why I've got these photographs of lead tablets is because what universities such as Macquarie University were doing in the past was physically unrolling these lead tablets to read the engravings on them. Now you can appreciate that the lead corrodes over time, becomes brittle, and so once these are unrolled, um, you're destabilizing them, exposing them to the elements. Um, and you're losing information at the point of breaking. So in the collection, uh, Macquarie University Ancient History Museum has uh, some wrapped up lead uh, tablets that have not been unrolled. So we conducted an experiment. We actually made our own um, lead scroll, wrote on it and scribed on it with a pin, rolled it up, CT scanned it, and it was successful. You can see the inscription on the right-hand side. And so they came to us with the real object and we CT scan that with neutrons at high resolution. Now you can imagine trying to read the text on a rolled document is a challenge. For many years, or for the last 15 or so years, researchers have been doing that with papyri. So um, using um, mathematical techniques to unroll a flat surface and then using XRF, a 3D XRF, for example, to read the text. That's not something you can do with a lead object with an inscription because the act of digitally flattening a um, lead sheet will also flatten the text. So it was only at a conference um, in 2018 um, that we met a, um, a biologist who was actually studying cancers of the colon and was CT scanning colons. And as part of his PhD, he needed to digitally unroll those colons and look at the psyllae, the finger-like projections so he's, he had developed an algorithm that flattened the intestine but retained the fine local structure. So here we are, we had this data set for a number of years and we're struggling with it. By the end of that day, the conference, we provided um, that researcher with our data and within half an hour, he had digitally unrolled it and presented us with this image. So based on these images, we've now un, um, started the process of translating this text, which was believed to be Aramaic and now learned that it is mandate, which is uh, a related, uh, but not, a, uh, not the same language. We're fortunate in Western Sydney, we actually have a mandate community. So we're gonna work with them to finish the translation. But basically we've uh, learned so far that this is a um, uh, sort of a religious text. And there's a bit of doom and gloom, which you expect with lead because the weight of the material sort of supports the weight of the message. So if you read through the text, you'll see they beat the children of Adam, they confound the secrets that are within, they mock the sleep. It's um, pretty full on. But we're excited um, that we will soon publish the largest mandate text ever found. As with all instruments, we get upgrades. So it was in 2018 when I joined the team. It was also in 2018 that we transitioned from slow CCD detectors to CMOS detectors. They have a much higher quantum efficiency larger areas of detection. We, we upgraded from a four to a 15 megapixel camera, and now we've gone all the way to 26 megapixel astronomy cameras. So um, our, our readouts are getting faster, our signal to noise is improving, and we're able to get higher and higher resolution over time. 
it means that our, our um, blurry tomograms are now extremely high resolution and very clean. It means that we can do high throughput studies. So this is, again, a case with Chris Wendrick, where you take a hopper, fill it with steel balls. There's a screw at the bottom. And because of this high speed, it meant that we could now CT scan this mass, go in the instrument every half hour, unwind the screw, and then look at how these granular balls flow as you um, release the base. And you can create time series of um, steel balls and their motion. Um, and Chris has a student that will be working through this data to look at the movement of every single steel ball, look at the crystalline regions, and just get an understanding how uh, flow occurs in such systems. Because we have difference in sensitivity to water and heavy water, it means that if you do difference maps, you can look at the flow live now of water and D2O through concrete. And Florian has taken this a step further and actually looked at reactions in thin films or um, vortex-driven reaction systems. So here is a, a movie of um, an enzyme reaction occurring at an interface between two liquids. And that spooling up or spinning that you saw at the beginning, there you go, just shows the difference between the deuterated and the non-deuterated liquid. And these devices uh, have, have actually won the researchers an Ig Nobel uh, Prize Award because these devices can be used to uncook an egg. So it's quite an interesting area of research. The sensitivity to D2O versus H2O and the um, improved detection limits mean that um, our staff, Floriano, are now collaborating with people to look at uh, polycrystalline ice. In other words, looking at how glaciers melt. And so they're able to map the transition from liquid to solid water by um, uh, having a blend of D2O and H2O and looking at the variation in concentrations um, and, and structure over time. The high-speed imaging means that we can work with museum objects and scan them so quickly that they remain radioactive for very short periods of time. So that means that we now have a high throughput capability. It also means that in the past, objects that came to us that we would need to store for months can be returned within days. And so the first announcement that came from this kind of method was Australia's first underwater archaeological site, uh, where uh, a whole heap of uh, First Nations objects were found underwater and neutron imaging was used to prove that these were in fact stone tools and not just simple rock. Now, based on this body of work, the Powerhouse Museum asked if they could apply our methods to their collection and, um, and uh, have a major exhibit. The Powerhouse Museum is in Sydney City. And the proposal was to combine our nuclear methods, our world-class capabilities applied to their objects and demonstrate how we can conserve them for future generations and provide insights into their structure. So I'll just focus on some of the, um, the neutron examples. The kind of things that we're highlighting was we're able to CT scan or, or just in this case, radiograph old cameras and find that they contained uh, their original film. In this case, the film most likely contains uh, photographs from a crime scene since it was a police spy camera. And uh, it means that we're able to image these without exposing the film. And if you'd applied x-rays, you most likely that film would have been destroyed on imaging. Um, we're able to gain insights into the German Enigma or code machine without opening it. And this just shows some radiographs. Uh, and this will be a future project where we'll get a student to actually um, fully CT scan that and create a digital twin of the object. The largest object we've ever radiographed on Dingo was this Tang Dynasty horse. And you can see that on the beam line there. Uh, and in the museum, you see where all the glue and adhesives and replacements have occurred are darker regions in the horse. So this is on display as part of the collection in the museum. We couple that with photogram photogrammetry results or surface scans from uh, University of New South Wales and work with their staff to form a digital twin or virtual reality component of the instrument. So for teaching purposes, if anyone asks, you know, what does Dingo look like and how do we conduct those radiographs, we can now allow them in a virtual environment to explore the operation of the instrument. So currently, this is just a video, but there, you can actually put on a headset and interact with this and move motors around. The end result is 
can we use this to teach users how to operate the instrument before they arrive to ASTA? Our sensitivity to hydrogen means that we can take ancient objects such as this figure of Artemis. And if you see the yellow blobs on that surface on the right-hand side, we can see the original pigment and the wax that was used to coat that object. We can take mechanical calculators and CT scan them, and we can not just look at the internal structure, but we can also identify the different alloys used. And again, most of these alloys would not be distinguished from each other in a CT scan conducted with x-rays. So There's a nice little result. So I'm conscious of time, so I might skip a few examples and just show that we can scan through gold. These objects are on, were on display for about a year in the museum. And Floriana in particular has done a lot of work with Tibetan statues, where in order to work out the provenance of these objects, you need to look inside them, identify the relics within them, and then the museums are using this information to um, assist with provenance studies. And this work is reported publicly at the museum, and it's also been reported through the International Atomic Energy Agency and the United Nations. Now, a final step here is that we can combine neutron and X-ray scans. So we can take those gray value scans, and we can look at the contrast in different parts of the cameras using neutrons, monochromatic and polychromatic X-rays, and we can combine them to form a holistic image where we can now identify materials within those cameras or within objects without opening them. And this is a new method exhibited at the museum. And I'll skip this one for time. So the end result was we had a major exhibition uh, at the Powerhouse Museum. 26 objects were on display with nine nuclear methods. This is the first time that neutron imaging was highlighted to the public. There were all sorts of public lectures and tours and so forth. There is a um, glossary on the Powerhouse Museum website. And there are QR codes where if you wanted to take a statue home, you take the photo of the QR code and you could have an augmented reality version at home. So for these efforts, our exhibit, as mentioned at the beginning, won the Museum and Gallery's National Award for Research in 2022, and we're very excited uh, to receive that. So wrapping up, where to from here? We now have a, a MOU or a signed uh, agreement with the Powerhouse Museum for long-term relationship uh, funding First Nations research, looking at future exhibits. Our team are providing guidance to the IAEA and the UNICRI, uh, which is the UN Inter-Regional Crime and Justice Research Institute, looking at how nuclear uh, neutron imaging and other methods can be used uh, to fight the illicit trafficking of cultural property. Our th high throughput capability is being parallelized for the purpose of developing a commercial um, capability, and that's for uh, mining or drill core characterization. So we've now got a rig where we can CT scan two and eventually three drill cores simultaneously. So at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned CT scanning with neutrons takes a day. Well, now we can CT scan 20 centimeters of drill core every half hour multiplied by three. And um, that's actually a speed that you cannot achieve at the high, same resolution using X-rays. So we're liaising with companies such as Aurelia, uh, which is an ASX listed company, um, to obtain samples of uh, gold drill cores to see, do neutrons work? Can we differentiate the different phases? And if we look at these numbers here, how do they compare to X-ray fluorescence surface, surface scans? Um, gold mining samples, you can't scan with X-rays because you don't get that penetration. Where to from here? Because we induce radioactivity in samples, can we use that to therefore quantify gold or other elements in neutron uh, image samples? To here, we've, here we've got Sharon McLeod, who's doing exactly that, developing um, uh, new imaging capabilities based on the residual radioactivity of our specimens. I mentioned a digital twin before, and I just want to highlight that a true digital twin actually accurately models the beamline. And with, when we can do that, we can model the potential radioactivity of specimens. 
And uh, Claudia Kopsky, who is a, a student currently at ANSTO, is, has actually completed a full-blown Monte Carlo simulation of our instrument based on CAD drawings, measured our spectrum, and modeled that for the first time. And we'll be implementing that uh, shortly um, to, improve, uh, to improve our user service. We're going towards high resolution. So we've been donated a neutron microscope from the Paul Scherer Institute. The first thing that we did was actually rip out the detectors and modify the front and back end to achieve higher resolution, uh, higher spatial resolution. And if you've got the video, you can look at the detail later. But I just want to point out that Florian is already getting some exceptional results. So the first results from this neutron uh, microscope that we can look at corrosion and the blending of gold and silver with extremely fine detail down to about five micron uh, resolution. Some work's been done with uh, the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab and RMIT to look at the carbonate veins uh, and mineralogy in Martian meteorites. And while we're on space, I'm just gonna highlight that we have a very exciting um, opportunity coming up in 2025. So the Powerhouse Museum is constructing a new museum. It's actually the world's largest museum project currently, and ANSTO is going to have a role in that. I just want to acknowledge everybody that's contributed to the 10 years of collaboration, from the initial uh, engineering and support teams and technical teams that resulted in the construction of the instrument, the user office for all their hard work and bringing the users through the front door the other staff at ANSTO and our collaborators to help design the instrument in the first place. The Invisible Revealed project involved a huge number of people across ANSTO and the Powerhouse Museum. I wish to acknowledge all of them. And purely on the cultural heritage and paleontology space, this just gives you an idea of the collaborators that we're working with. And I could show you five to 10 of these slides. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. Okay, thanks, Joseph. This is really fantastic talking. Actually, it gives me a different point of view on the neutron uh, techniques and its applications. So we still got uh, several minutes left. So any questions, you can uh, put a hand up and uh, I'll pop in the Q&A session. So uh, actually, I I will I will have I will have the first question. So uh, because, uh, although it's not my first time to listen the related topic, but this time it's uh, more details and many many more informations uh, is pro provided. So I just wonder. So uh, after that part. So, what's the post data processing after you collect the, uh, after you collect those uh, images? Yeah, so so we typically generate the three dimensional gray value reconstructions, and um, there are free there are free software such as Dragonfly or um, or other um, packages that our researchers uh, now have access to. So it typically involves a student um, sitting at a computer. And um, you can easily use gray value thresholding for quick segmentation. Um, and the tools are quite clever now, with, uh, especially with machine learning. So you might have 4,000 slices through an object, and you might need to train your, your computer based on segmentation of 10 to 20 slices, and then it'll try to extend that through the whole volume. With others, particularly in the geology space, um, where you've got unclear boundaries between fossils and rocks, or in cultural objects, Students are sitting there, slice by slice, coloring in what they see. And I guess this is a nice segue to say that our data sets are actually um, are suitable for mass playing around with, so citizen science programs. So we, there may be cases in future where we upload data sets to public um, databases where students from around the world can color in just to um, assist with research programs. And that's what tends to slow us down. It's the colorization of those scans and interpretation. Okay, so I, I think Chris got another question. Yes, please, Chris. Yeah, thank, thanks for an excellent presentation, um, Joseph. Um, thank you. My, my, I guess my question is around um, resolution and how you how do you make the decision about what resolution you scan a fossil in? I mean, you, you don't quite know what you're looking for until you see it. So how, yeah. do you, how do you load that into the start? 
I guess my sec the second part of that question is obviously th there's an element where the scan that you do is then the research tool that kind of it's probably never going to be scanned again, right? And so that's right. Uh, that re that resolution is super important, I guess, for for sort of future proofing that scan. How do you make that decision? Yeah, correct. Um, it's not easy to make, and in fact, it's an issue we we hit almost every day. So when people come to us, they say we want the highest resolution possible, and um, it's a balance between signal to noise, which is you know how many exposures do you have for each radiograph, how long do you expose for, and resolution. And uh, for resolution, you need to collect more images as you rotate the object. Um, so it's a balance between pixel size, distance to the detector, all sorts of others. So in the end. Um, I should go backwards. We were scanning, giving people the best possible resolution, and then realized that ultimately, if we bin the data to improve the signal to noise, it makes the thresholding and the segmentation for them a lot easier. And you can get sub pixel resolution using um, these thresholding techniques um, with the reconstruction software. So we find that in the end, we should just supply the best quality data, no matter what that resolution is. Uh, because you don't want someone to go with a high resolution noisy data set. Um, and so the true, the best true spatial resolution of the instrument, no matter what pixel size you pick in our regular configuration, is around 30 microns. Um, and so if we aim for that to be at least double the pixel size, then people are going to be happy. And our field of view in, um, in that case is going to be, say, 10 by 10 centimeters. So we can do very high resolution over large objects. And so it's just a balance between timing, the speed, and also the inherent radioactivity. If people don't want their fossils back for months, then we can do a five-day scan. Does that answer your question? I know. So we got a quick question from the chart. So yes. uh, when what is the next exhibition? And do you plan another one at the Powerhouse Museum? Okay, simple answer, yes. So there will be a major exhibition in 2025. I can't give you details on it yet because it hasn't been announced, but uh, we've we've already got some beam time approved at the Australian Synchrotron in preparation for that. Um, I'm just gonna say it's gonna have some very cool and very large objects um, and you'll see it at Parramatta in 2025. Okay, really exciting. We are looking forward to that, okay. Thank Any you. other questions? So I, I think we are pretty on time. So thanks again for Joseph to come and give us this fantastic talk. So okay, thanks for everyone to attend, and see you. Thank you very much for listening and being here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Joseph. <laughs>